Hello, everyone, and welcome to, to today's live webinar, Overview of the New ERA Guidelines, Changes and Revisions, presented by Dr. Fawn, Regulatory Affairs Scientist, Smithers. I'm Christy Jewell of Labroots, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots and sponsored by Smithers. For more information on our sponsor, please visit smithers.com. Now, before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them in the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. We will also be conducting a few polls throughout, and we appreciate your participation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, Click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or you can let us know you're having a problem by using the ask your question box. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd now like to present today's speaker, Dr. Eric Fawn. Dr. Fawn is a regulatory scientist with particular experience in environmental fate modeling and regulatory affairs. Dr. Fawn has spent 14 years working in academia, industry, and at European contract research organizations and regulatory consultancies. For a complete biography on Dr. Fawn, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Now, before I pass this over to Dr. Fawn, let's take our first poll. What is your current experience of environmental risk assessment pharmaceuticals. Is it new to you? Is this an indirect experience, a direct experience, or would some people call you an industry expert? Please check one, and we thank you for your participation. Dr. Fon, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you very much, Christy, and I want to welcome everybody who decided to join us this afternoon. My name is uh, Eric Fon, as, as uh, Christy just presented. I want to inform you that this is going to be some sort of a high-level webinar where we'll try as much as possible to provide information on what changes have taken place in the guidance and how these changes will affect marketing authorization going forward. I also want to encourage you to submit questions at the end. We have, we have a Q&A session and we'll try to take as many questions as possible. So the current version of the European Medicines Agency guidance on environmental risk assessment was was finalized in 2006, but I want to just go through a historical perspective of what has changed over, over the years. I mean, the European Union or the European Economic Community started regulating medicine since 1965. The previous guidelines or guidance that were available at that time have gone through a number of changes which has culminated to this new version we have today. Most notably is, is during the 90s where we have had a draft for environmental assessment of non-GMO products. In 2006, there was a draft, a draft guideline that was finalized by the Committee on Human Medicinal Products, and this guidance was, was signed into law in 2006. There were discussions, it was a first guidance as such, so things were not clear. Discussions were held at the European level, but there was no agreement. A QA document was instead releasing in 2011, which was updated in, in 2016. So we can see that it's, it's been a long road, and this, this road is, we are still on that road. A new guidance is, is, is now available in draft version. So just looking back at what we have today as, 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 as the guidance, what is available today, we can see how the tiered approach for environmental risk assessment of medicinal product works in the European Union. I have a, I have a scheme in, on, on, on your screens at, at the moment, so I'll just take it from the top left going towards the right. I mean, in today's risk assessment, what we are interested in is to look at the exposure, the basic exposure concentration, which is tied to the daily dose of, of the medicinal product, and we look at the toxicology or the, the, uh, the mode of action. If we can 
calculate a exposure concentration that is greater than 0.01 micrograms per liter, which is the cutoff for the EU. If that concentration is greater than 0.01, the studies on the middle big box are triggered. These are environmental faith studies, ecotoxicology studies, and physical chemistry studies. The data generated from those studies are used to, to perform a risk assessment. And at the end of that process, if we, we, could, we could conclude that there are no, no risk or all, all compartments are resolved, then the risk assessment goes, goes ahead. We prepare an expert report and conclude that there is no risk. However, if based on the data that is generated at that phase two, most especially from the OECD 106, which is the adsorption desorption study, if the adsorption constant is greater than 10,000, it triggers a phase two TAB. And the studies that are performed on, at tier 2 b are dependent on the results of, 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 of uh, the TA study. There is one other thing to look at, the partition coefficient of the drug. If the KOW, which is the octanol water partition coefficient, is greater than 4.5, that triggers a PBT assessment. That is, we have to assess the persistence, the bioaccumulation, and the toxicity. How that assessment is done is today not covered in the, in the EMA guidance. We have to refer to, to REACH, that's the European uh, Union chemical legislation. It's Annex 7 gives a very, very an authoritative and complete guidance on how a PBT assessment should be performed. Secondly, if there are indications, I mean, if this drug is not designed to, to affect reproduction, then there are indications of reproductive toxicity, then we have to look at the endocrine mode of action and make an evaluation and conclusion and perhaps uh, recommend other studies that, that will address uh, the endocrine concerns. And most basically, if the exposure concentration is below 0.01 and there are no other concerns, then the assessment can stop at that level. So we can see that the, the flow chart is just a clean scheme, starting with the exposure, looking at the intrinsic properties, the physical chemistry properties, and then making a, a conclusion. This is the current guidance we, we have at, at the moment. Now we come to the new guidance. This guidance was published on, on the European Medicines website on, on 15th of November 2018. There was a consultation period, which is part of, of European law. Before a new guidance is finalized, it's open for the public, whether scientists, interested parties, and the pharmaceutical industry to comment on the, on the, on, on the terms of the guidance. This ended on 30th of June. I hope a lot of you submitted comments or questions for, for clarifications. These comments are now being reviewed, so to speak, by the uh, Committee on Human Medicinal Products. At the end of the process, a new guidance will be, will be, will be finalized. It will replace the current guidance from, from 2006. The current guidance still offers the same legal basis. It's drawn from, from, from the same directive, so the legal basis stays the same. And the current guidance compared to, to uh, the, the new guidance when compared to the current guidance now offers a, a clear decision tree, a stepwise procedure on how the risk assessment will be done going forward. If we look at the scope of the legal basis, as I mentioned, the legal basis is still Article 8.3 of Directive 2001-83, which clearly states that an environmental risk assessment is required for all new marketing authorization applications. Type two variations, which are major changes for extension applications, you may have to make a judgment. Is there a potential increase in exposure? If the answer is yes, then you need a risk assessment. For type one variations, which are variations that doesn't affect the safety or efficacy of the drug, you may not submit a new application or a new risk assessment. This may be a change in the address of the authorization holder. These are minor changes. For type 1B variations, which are you, you, in, you have to inform the agency before doing those sort of changes, that generally they do not affect the exposure. So a new uh, environmental risk assessment is, is not required. The new guidance handles the issue with generics. Today, you can cross-reference to the dossier. But going forward, that cross-reference should be accompanied 
by, by a letter of access from the originator of that drug with consent to say you can refer to that data. The new guidance just touches on, on pharmaceutical uh, on drug products that have radiochemicals within them. This, there is additional guidance from the Euro, uh, Euroatom Agency. That guidance is still in place. However, certain issues may be handled under the, uh, under the, the, the new proposed guidance. So that is just a brief description of, of how this guidance uh, came from, I mean, from the historical perspective to where we are with the update of the guidance in, in 2018. So I'll just pass you over to, to, to Chrissy to, to read the, the second survey question, please. Yes, thank you, Dr. Fon. Now our next question for our audience, are you expecting to be involved with the environmental risk assessment of pharmaceuticals? Are you currently in the middle of one? In the next 12 months, greater than 12 months time, or no, you will not be involved. Thanks for your participation. Please check one, and I will pass it back over to Dr. Fon. Thank you very much, Christy. So we are just going to spend a couple of look at a couple of slides that explain what, what has changed in, in the new guidance. I think the first notable change compared to the 2006 guidance is that there is a decision tree which specify on that, which gives a very good summary on when you need to do a risk assessment. This decision tree has choke points where you move through the tree. If one of the, if the answer is yes, you go further. If the answer is no, then you may stop at, at, at that point. So that's the first change that we can see just looking at, at the new guidance. Secondly, Looking at the studies that, that, that are required, e.g. for physical chemistry, there is more studies now recommended in the new guidance. Third, the sediment risk assessment. I think in one of the slides I showed where we had the studies that are performed at phase two TAA, the sediment risk assessment study was not in that, on that list. In the new guidance going forward, that study is required upfront. I'll, I'll come to why, why that's the case. On the other hand, the new guidance, the, one of the longest and most extensive studies that is currently performed, which is the sediment water aerobic study, which is OECD 308, is no longer required upfront. This study may be performed under certain conditions that we we'll discuss uh, further down, down the presentation, but this study is now not a mandated study. The new change as well is that the new guidance has introduced trigger values for groundwater, soil, and secondary poisoning. Groundwater assessment was, was performed in the, in, the, in the current guidance, just looking at the KOC of the drug substance, but now the, the setting trigger values, the soil assessment is no longer a tier 2B as we saw in the flow scheme that I presented, and secondary poisoning was not even mentioned in the current 2006 guidance. So these are notable changes. Looking at individual studies, we now have an, the earthworm reprodu uh, reproduction study, which is now included instead of the acute study in the 2006 guidance. There are technical details, clarifications on, on studies. The new guidance mentions method development, how some of the studies can be performed, which clarifies some of the issues that were, were recognized in, in, in the old guidance. And there is a new section that deals with antibiotics, endocrine active substance, substances that are persistent, bioaccumulation and toxic, and as well the, the secondary poisoning. So I have just taken this directly from, from, from the new guidance just to, to, to show how that decision tree looks like. It's a series of questions. If we just start from the top, the first thing to look at is that you need to do an environmental assessment for, for, for environmentally relevant compound. I mean, we can say upfront that biological molecules, carbohydrates, proteins are not, you don't need to perform a risk assessment upfront if the, these proteins are not modified. And then going to the second branch of that tree, you can either go through the route of the risk assessment, there it's based solely on the daily dose of the drug, and as, as I said, the cutoff is two milligrams. Any drug that is administered at two milligrams per liters uh, per day, sorry, requires a risk assessment in principle. 
On the right-hand side of the flow scheme, we have the PBT assessment. This is based on the intrinsic property of the drug substance. We are now looking at the partition coefficient. So those two aspects now form the phase one assessment, the risk assessment based on the drug daily dose and the PBT assessment based on the low KOW. We move down the tree. The next question is the decision tree, including peg surface water. If you look at the, 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 the box just under, you need to determine the, uh, the uh, exposure concentration, which based on the uh, on a two milligram limit will give you a exposure concentration greater than 0 0.01. If that exposure concentration is less than 0 0.01, no further assessment is necessary. So you, we move from one section to the other, answering the questions and providing the answers, and the report that is prepared at the end will reflect how these questions uh, were, were, were answered. I'm not going to go through all the sections of, 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 of the, the, the flow scheme, but in, I'll discuss them in, 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 in subsequent slides. And then the, if we blow up the, the phase one, just the phase one part, I just mentioned the decision tree regarding the limit based on two milligrams per liter. And the sections under, the, 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 you have a 4.1, 4.3. These are the sections where further clarifications are offered in the new guidance regarding that aspect. So if you want to read more about PBT screening, if you go to section 5.1 in the new guidance, it deals with PBT screening. So if we take our decision tree for phase one, the question one is, is the active substance a naturally occurring substance? If the answer is yes, now we are looking at things like proteins, we are looking at maybe carbohydrate, any naturally occurring substance, because the, 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 the assumption is that the amount of that substance already present in the environment is not going to be affected by by, the, by its use in that drug, so there is not going to be a change in environmental concentration. The next question is, does this application refer to an extent, uh, Article 10 of, of Directive 2001? Article 10 just looks at what sort of application you are looking at. Is it, is it a new application for a new active substance? Is it going through the central procedure to the European Medicines Agency, or is it going through a, a decentralized procedure when you send it to, 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 to a member state. The question 2B is now the crucial one. Does the applicant have access to an earlier error? This is important for, for companies dealing with generics. If the answer is yes, it means you, have, you don't only have access to that data, you have access to the report as well. This means you must have contacted the originator Signed, agreed on the, on the letter of access that will be submitted together with, with, with your risk assessment. The next question is, was a default marketing, market penetration factor used in the risk assessment? Now, this is where we have to be, be careful. In some risk assessments, for some reason, you may want to refine the marketing penetration factor. Just to, to, to go one step back, the default value for the FPEN, the market penetration factor, is 0.01 or 1% of the population. The agency assumes that 1% of the population is using that drug at the same time. For some reason, you may go in and say this drug is meant for less than 10,000 people in the EU, so you can work out what that percentage is. If you did that and there is a generic or there is another drug that uses that active substance, then you have to be careful how you refine your exposure concentration, which is taken up in, in the next question, 2D. Is there an increase in environmental exposure? An increase in environmental exposure, in theory, may occur if a drug, if you expand the patient population. If on the first marketing authorization application, this drug was, this was used only by a proportion of the population just pediatric population, for example, and then you want to extend to cover adults, then in principle, there is an increase in exposure, which means you need to do a new risk assessment. That doesn't necessarily mean that you need to do a new study. It just means you need to recalculate your, your risk ratios and, and prepare a new report. So we can walk through these questions at, and at certain points, once the answer is, and no, then we can stop and we can prepare the risk assessment. So if we go to the last question there, question seven, 
does the active substance have a specific toxicity profile? This will cover, in general, things like endocrine active substances or antimicrobials. If there is that specific, a specific toxicity profile, that means the, the decision tree will need certain modifications. For an endocrine drug, if the daily dose is less than two, but we have that toxicity profile, that doesn't necessarily stop the, the, the assessment. It just means we have to tailor the assessment because of, of that toxicity profile. Go to the next slide. So if we look at the phase two for in the new guideline, as we said, the phase two is required when the exposure concentration, which is the, the PEC, the predicted environmental concentration in surface water, is greater than 0.01. Once that is established, and I can, you can upfront establish that just by looking at the daily dose of two milligrams, then you need to do a surface water assessment, a sediment assessment, and a sewage treatment plant. However, if we are looking at specific toxicity profiles and things like endocrine active substances or antiparasitics, irrespective of the PEC surface water value, if it's if daily dose is below 2, which implies the PEC is below 0.01, you still need to do a phase 2 evaluation because of that specific toxicity profile. Then, for certain compartments, you only need to do an assessment if certain triggers are met. This includes a soil assessment, a groundwater assessment, and secondary poison assessment. We are, we are going to look at these triggers in, in the next slide. So if we, oh, sorry, I skipped one slide there, yeah. So let's look at the trigger values for, for, for soil assessment and groundwater. In the current guidance from 2006, we go to phase 2B just looking at the sludge, the, the absorption constant for sludge. This is derived from the OECD 2, a 106 study, and the cutoff value is just 10,000. If the KOC sludge is greater than 10,000, we automatically trigger a phase 2B assessment. Now, how has this changed? If we look at the guidance, it has now included, look, it has now included looking at the KOC and the predicted environmental concentration. And there is a reason for this. In most cases, you find you have drugs that are, are this. Uh, drugs that are administered at very high doses, a thousand milligrams, so to speak, per day, and drugs that are administered at low doses, just below 50 milligrams. If a drug is administered at a thousand milligrams and the KOC is below 10,000, then in principle, you will not need to do a phase 2B assessment. While a drug that is administered at below 50 milligrams and has a high KOC, you need to do a phase two assessment. Now, there is that issue of you have a very high exposure from that high dose, which is not, is, it, is, it, is not taking account of when we look at the current guidance. That's why the, the new guidance now has this issue of we look at the exposure concentration. If the KOC is greater than 10,000, irrespective of the exposure concentration, you need to do a soil assessment. The second trigger is if the KOC is between 5,000 and 10,000, now you need to look at the exposure concentration as well. If it's greater than one micrograms per liter, then you need to do a soil assessment as well. And going down, you have, 1, 000, if the KOC is between 1,000 and 2,500, then the cutoff for the exposure concentration is 3 micrograms per liter. Just looking at this table, it just means that a lot of drug substances going forward will need a phase 2B assessment. Just, just, just looking at that. In many cases, the KOC will lie between 1,000 and about 5,000, and the, P, the PEC will be in that range of 2 to 3. So most of them, which are assessed, after this new guidance is finalized, we need a phase 2B assessment. And then we, if we look at the trigger for groundwater, today the trigger is still, is still a matter of the, of the KOC 10,000, 
except the substance is biodegradable. We have an OECD 301, which tells us that information. But in most cases, pharmaceuticals are not degradable, so we still need to do that, that groundwater uh, assessment. Next slide, yeah. So we go to secondary poisoning, which, which is one of the new things in the new guidance. Secondary poisoning is just uptake of a toxic substance through an indirect route. Just, just a, a crude definition. If we take an aquatic organism, fish, for example, the fish is in, in water that, that has a certain concentration of, of a toxic substance or a pharmaceutical active ingredient. This fish can respire this through the gills and there is uptake through respiration. That's a direct exposure. However, this fish as well consumes other fish or other aquatic organisms that have these toxic substances. So there, there are two ways of this drug substance going to the fish. It could either be through a direct means or it could either be through an indirect means. That indirect means is what is referred to as a secondary poisoning uh, in the new guidance. And secondary poisoning comes to effect or is important if the partition coefficient is greater than or equal to three. Once that happens, that triggers the OECD 305, which is a fish bioconcentration study. And after the study, if your bioconcentration factor, which is the ratio of the concentration, the exposure concentration or the, on the concentration in the aquatic organism, if it's greater than 100, then you need to do secondary poisoning. The assessment itself doesn't need any new data being generated. You can look at other sections of the, of the, the drug file. You look at the mammalian toxicology data to get a no effect level to use in that assessment, so to speak. And then you can calculate the PNEC, that is a predicted no effect concentration, and you make the assessment for, for secondary poisoning. If there is no mammalian toxicology data, which, which is in really, really rare cases because drug substances will have a, a mammalian toxicology data, then you don't need to, 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 to do any testing. You could use a theoretical assessment, probably using QSAR model to, to determine a PNEC. The next new thing that has been introduced in the new guidance is the term endocrine active substance. Endocrine active substances, they cover drugs that have a specific mode of action. It may be drugs that are designed to affect reproductive organs or designed to affect reproductive processes. Those drugs will be, will be endocrine active drugs. There are other drugs that by design were not never intended to affect reproductive organs or reproductive processes, they will fall under this, this, this category. And this drug will require two theoretical assessments. You have to assess the endocrine mode of action, a risk assessment based on that, and you have to assess the, the drug as, as a chemical entity as well. The second new term is the antimicrobial mode of action. Here, the action limit, as I, as I explained previously, does not apply irrespective of the action, uh, the, 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 the meat. If you have an antimicrobial mode of action or an endocrine mode of action, you need to do a phase 2A assessment. And for these drugs and the environmental phase studies, all environmental phase studies are required. You may tailor your effect studies I mean, for, for, for a normal chemical entity, you need to do a fish early life stage study. However, if you have an endocrine mode of action, then you need to do a chronic study, a chronic long-term study, which would be the Medaka extended generation. The fish early life stage now becomes redundant. It's, it's, not, it's not important. And looking at other directives that looks at uh, protection of animals in, animal, uh, in, in, in research, you, you will be able to do both studies. So that's what is called a tailored amendment. You look at the properties of the active substance and tailor the testing to address those specific issues. For soil and sediment, there is no way to tailor. You have to do the studies that are recommended. For endocrine active substance, as I said this is a new term that is introduced in the, in the new guideline. These active substances, the target endocrine organs, just, just to recap, we have to review, we have to look at other sections of the drug 
in vitro and uh, in vivo for, uh, review for, of the drug, the data that were generated. We follow a weight of evidence to tailor the testing. The number of studies are listed in the new guidance that can be used. They may be short-term studies, short-term chronic studies, or they may be multi-generation studies. These studies are only performed in most cases after discussion or we recommend discussion with, with, with the rapporteur just to make sure we don't have any uh, surprises at the end. These are complex studies and you could generate a whole number of information that may, may not be, be necessary for that compound. So it's, it's always important to, to, to talk to your regulator before doing this study. And for tailored assessment, as I said, we can tailor the, the fish studies but if if we look at this picture here on the right of 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 of, of your screens, this is a graph that just to to make sure we are clear here, this was not produ produced by us. If you look during the review of the guidance, I think a group at the I think it was the Danish Environmental Protection Agency actually made this assessment where they looked at a series of species and they tried to calculate sensitivity ratios for antimicrobials. They could see that antimicrobials, anti I mean, the, the presence of data for fish or from an activated sludge respiration inhibition test doesn't really affect the risk assessment itself. That is why in the new guidance for antimicrobials, you don't need to perform these studies because they don't play any important role in, 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 the, in the risk assessment. The revised guideline has now clarify this. So for antimicrobials, you need to do a number, not just one algae study, you need to do a number of algae studies, and you don't need to do a fish study. So we, we, have, we, we have the studies listed there on, on the right. That is because this is a tailored assessment. We, we tailor this assessment to answer that specific question. Now, if the active substance has antimicrobial mode of, an antimicrobial mode of action, as well as another mode of action, which is not antimicrobial, then you may still need to do a fish study and the activated sludge study. Go to the next slide. So we are looking now at, at the PBT assessment, which, as I said, is the assessment of the persistence, the bioaccumulation, and the toxicity of, of your substance, which is, an, which is a hazard sort of uh, assessment. When do we test for, for, PB, for PBT? The first thing to look at is the log KOW. If the log KOW is greater than 4.5, then that triggers the PBT screening. By the time we make that assessment, we have a low KOW. If this drug substance is also administered at greater than two milligrams, by definition, the exposure is greater than 0 0.01. So you may have already conducted, conducted a batch of uh, environmental fate studies. If one of these studies is, is a fish study, it's a fish early life cycle study, that data is used to assess toxicity. If you have conducted an OECD 305, that data as well is, will be used to assess bioaccumulation. And if you have conducted a soil assessment, that data is used to assess the persistence. If you have not conducted those studies, then you need to conduct these studies to address the PBT uh, classification of, of this active substance. So for persistence, the new guidance has a, a number of options. In the current guidance, it's just the 308, but in the new guidance, you could either do the 308, which is the water sediment, the 307, which is a soil study, or the 309, which is just the, the water uh, study itself. So you could pick and choose depending on the specific circumstance. As I said, if a soil assessment is already triggered, you need the 307. So by definition, that is the data that you use to, to perform your persistence assessment. And if you look at the bioaccumulation, once the low KOW is greater than 4.5, by definition is greater than three. So you may have conducted a bioconcentration study as well. That data comes into assessment of bioaccumulation and the toxicity if you have not if you are looking at at, at at a situation where you haven't performed the fish study the oecd 210 you could still use your algae because this as i said this is a hazard assessment 
the, the assessment is described in REACH Annex 7. It says when you could classify substances as a persistent substance, looking at the half-life better than 40 days. Bioaccumulation currently stands at, at 2,000 if the BCF is greater than 2,000. Then the, the drug substance takes uh, that classification. Now, the new and the old guidance currently doesn't have any implications for a drug that is classified as PBT. That hasn't changed in the new guidance. There is no implication because it's mentioned somewhere in the new guidance that you have to take precautions. I mean, you, maybe you have to review your labeling and, and maybe at some point you, you have to, to, to undergo some sort of a, a, a routine a monitoring just to make sure concentrations are not, are not higher than, than what, is, what is expected if the drug becomes uh, used by, by a large amount of a number of the population. On the next slide, I think this is just a summary of how the, the, the new guidance looks at, at, at the phase 2B. So at phase 2B in the old guidance, we only look at the adsorption constant. Once it's greater than 10,000, then we go to phase 2B. That situation doesn't exist anymore at this stage. The phase 2B now depends on the adsorption constant. It depends on the exposure concentration. Now, if you need to do a phase 2B assessment for surface water, this is a bit different. You have performed your, your, your phase 2A assessment, you look at your exposure, generated ecotoxicity data, and then your risk ratio is greater than one. That's the exposure, the effect, the exposure concentration is greater than the effect. How do you proceed? You can refine your market penetration factor, which is the FN. You, you could do that, but you need to, generate, to, to show the agency that you, you, you have data that is adequate. You can look at the consumption. I mean, you can look at metabolism. You can look at the admin section of, of your drug file and see whether this drug is, is, is metabolized. You have to be careful here. If the, metabolic, metab if the metabolites are as well active, which in some cases for, you could find in, 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 in drug substances, then you may need to ask yourself, what do I assess? Is it the active substance or the metabolite? Because when, once you perform this, this, this refinement based on metabolism, you are opening the door to further assessment. You may now end up with two active substances to, to, to assess. You may also need to look at the removal in a sewage treatment plant. There is a dedicated model from, from the EU, this, the STP model, where based on the physical chemical properties, you can calculate how much of the drug is retained in a, in a sewage treatment plant and how much is emitted in the, into the receiving water. And then for the definitive PBT assessment, you only need it when the trigger is met. That is when the log KOW is greater than, than 4.5. For the sediment assessment, once you refine the surface water assessment, since you calculate your sediment exposure concentration from the water concentration, you can, by definition, refine your sediment concentration as well at phase two without generating any data. And then for groundwater, you could refine your pex, your, your groundwater concentration as well depends on the surface water concentration. So if you refine your surface water concentration, by definition, you refine your surface water concentration. Or the new guidance now has a model developed, I think, from the, the German regulatory agency called Simba Phi. This model you could use to predict groundwater concentration based on, on the intrinsic properties of a, of a drug a substance. That, that's a new option that is now available in the new guidance. And then for your soil assessment, you could, if you refine your surface water as well, you could refine your soil concentration. And here, that's where you have one new data that you need to do if you need to refine. You just have to extend your, your nitrogen transformation study to 100 days to get the, the, the effect data for, for, for that assessment. Next slide. So the tailored assessments. We've spoken about tailored assessment for 
endocrine substances and substances with, with specific mode, mode of action. The load assessment, I will repeat this, is going to depend on the mode of action. I think we, we have seen a lot of cases where there are drug substances that were not designed to interact with the with the endocrine system or designed to, with endocrine processes or designed to, to affect reproduction. We, we have seen that in, in many cases. That's why we have the endocrine active substances section of, of the new guidance. And as I mentioned, you could weave some studies with justification. So an endocrine drug, if the exposure is not above 0.01, then you can actually weave your the OECD 209, which is the uh, activated sludge inhibition test, and you can weave your fish early life stage because that study does not it's not it's not sensitive enough for for endocrine act, active uh, substances. You could check for every I mean in 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 the studies that are recommended, you could check for evidence of it, uh, effect for for sex ratio whether there is feminization. This will be generated in your in your multi generational study. This data is generated from that study. That is what is used for 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 the assessment. So we have just had. The, very high level look at how this guidance has, has changed, what it has introduced. And just to, to recap, it has introduced a decision tree, new triggers for soil, groundwater, and, and sediment, uh, sediment risk assessment. It has moved some studies from a phase 2B up to phase 2 TAA and introduced secondary poisoning assessment. So on the next slide, I've tried to capture these changes in in a single slide, this this picture is is, is similar to, to to the picture on on slide two where we we, we had the current guidance the TA approach. Immediately you could see that this this picture is is expanded compared to the first one. If we start from the top left, we have a decision tree where we run through this decision tree until we get the answer no, and then we do our assessment. Things to consider is the application status. Is it a new application? Is it for a generic application? Is the action limit greater than one? Is there potential for increase in exposure? All those questions, we go into your phase one assessment. The answers as well will go in there. If, if it's a generic application, then you need to contact the originator to get the letter of access. That may, and then you look at the log KOW if it's greater than 4.5, or there is an endocrine mode of action, or antimicrobial mode of action. Then you go to your PBT assessment, which is based on the log KOW, or a tailored assessment, which is based on the on the mode of action. For tailored assessment, you need always your environmental phase studies. You can adapt your aquatic ecotox studies. And the sediment toxicity study as well is recommended. You can waive that study. For your PBT assessment, for persistence, you need the, the water sediment study or just the water only study or the soil study. You, you can just do one, not, not, not both, not all three of them. For bioaccumulation, you need to do your OECD 305, which is a fish bio concentration study. The new guidance says you could do it in other species, example, mussels. So if, if there is a lab that has experience in doing that, they can actually conduct that study using, using mussels. And then for your toxicity, you could look at the CM, the, the intrinsic property classification of the drug itself, or you could look at the, the ecotox studies that have been generated, what is the NOEC or the EC50, and you can make a judgment on whether that active substance meets the criteria for classification. If the answer is, a drug can only be classified if it meets all three. It has to be persistent, persistent it has to be bioaccumulative, it has to be toxic, then it's a PBT substance. But if it just meets one or just two of them, then it's not a PBC, PBT substance. The report will only say, if, for example, if the drug is persistent, but the bio concentration factor is less than 2,000, then you don't need to test toxicity because it cannot be a PBT. And it's, it's a stepwise study as well. You start with persistence. Since you don't need any aquatic species, just for the protection of uh, vertebrates as well in, in research, that's the reason why we start with the persistence. If it's not persistent, then you stop. But if it's very persistent, which means DT50 is in the 120, 180 days, then you look at the bioaccumulation. 
if it's not bioaccumulative, just because it's, it's very, very persistent, you still need to label that, that, that drug as, as, as a very persistent compound. The second thing to look at from the decision trees, is that concentration greater than 0.01? If the answer is yes, in the first slide I showed the study, we had seven studies, but now we have this, this, the number of studies has increased. The notable changes are the water solubility study, which in some cases was always performed as part of the partitioning study, is now done as standalone. There is a recommendation to look at dissociation in water. Today, we often calculate dissociation constant using QSAR models. But going forward, you may need to perform that study. You may need to look at the spectra of the, of the active substance. This, this is a new study that has been included in the guidance. Studies that are asterisks, are, you, you may choose to, to do these studies. You can look at melting point, vapor pressure as well. I mean, for some drugs, you, 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 the, 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 the vapor pressure can be implied. I mean, if it's a solid, you could assume that the vapor pressure is, is going to be quite low, so you don't necessarily need to perform that study. The KOW, is, is normally there. You may have already done it in your phase one because it's used in the PBT assessment, the biodegradation. You need to do that study. And now the sediment toxicity study is included in a phase two TA assessment. That's a major change in, in the new guidance. The reason for this is that most drug substances will actually partition to the sediment. So there is no reason why that study is not done upfront. Now we have the algae growth study, algae growth study, which is we have an asterisk, and there's a note to say tailored studies may be required for antimicrobials. We had a list of three, four studies that are now in the guidance for antimicrobials. Now, after your phase two TAA testing, then your phase two TAA risk assessment will look at surface water, sediment, and the sewage treatment plant. We have to ask the data generated in the phase 2a box will, will be enough to make that assessment and then if you look at your oecd 106 and then we follow the triggers that that i showed in in one of the slides you come you take that trigger and your exposure concentration then you determine the need for a soil assessment your koc as well will, will show you the need for a groundwater assessment and your low kow will show you the need for a secondary assessment if you need to do a phase two A soil assessment, not phase two B, it's called now a phase two A soil assessment, then you need to perform the nitrogen transformation study, the terrestrial plant, the earthworm, and the columbola. And then if your chaos is less than 10,000, that's, that's the, the, the groundwater assessment. And if your KOW is greater than three, that's your secondary poisoning. If at the end of this testing, you can conclude that there is no risk, no further testing is required. But if there is a risk in any of the compartments, then you need to do a phase two TAB. Now, this phase two TAB is quite different from what is in the current guidance. The phase two TAB in the new guidance, it only deals with refinement. You could go back and ask yourself, is that drug substance metabolized? If yes, what, are the, what percentage is actually excreted? What, what amount of the drug is retained in a sewage treatment plant? If you apply all those changes, you can modify your surface water, you perform your risk assessment, and you make a conclusion. If at the end, the risk assessment cannot be resolved, there is no further testing that is required. You have to discuss this with the rapporteur and come to some agreement on how this drug will be labeled. No further testing is required. So we have seen how the new guidance in effect has increased the number of studies that are required. There is also a section in the new guidance which actually goes into how studies are performed. For example, the method development in most cases in the new guidance, the Rapporteur will want to see a report on the method development. That's a new report that is in, in current practice. The method development is integrated with the, the ecotoxicity studies, but the method development now will be a standalone report that is sent to, 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 to the agency. And going to the KOC, the OECD 106, there again, there is another o, uh, EU group that is working on uh, on a new guidance, which I think it's already finalized on how the, KO, the OECD 106 should be performed and reported. 
this new guidance refers to, 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 to that document on how that study should be performed. So you have to prove to the agency that you have, you have followed that, that guidance, which is not under the, the control of, of EMA. You have to prove that that guidance is followed. And you have to prove that your KOC, your, your, your KOC uh, that you, you have generated responds to all the, the triggers in that document, which, as I said, is not under the purview of, of, of the agency. So that, that concludes our, our look at, at how this new guidance has, has changed the testing and the assessment of active substances. So I'll pass it over to, to Christy for, for, for the third survey question, please. Thank you, Dr. Fon, for your informative presentation. Now let's begin our live Q&A with, with asking our audience one last question. Would you like to learn more about how the revision of the guidance could affect your, could affect your marketing authorization application in the future? I'll ask that question again. Would you like to learn more about how the revision of the guidance could affect your marketing authorization application in the future? Just check yes or no. And we thank you for, for your participation today. Now we have some great questions coming in for Dr. Fong. And as a reminder, if you do have a question you'd like to ask and you haven't done so, now is the time to do it. Just type it in the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen and hit send. Dr. Fong will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. And those questions we are unable to answer live and those submitted during the on-demand period will be answered via the email address you provided at the time of registration. Okay, Dr. Okay. Fon, your first question. Thank you question. very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you very much, Chrissy. I think I've just taken a brief look at, at, at the survey uh, answers, and I see that, I mean, a lot of users, it's, it's, it's quite interesting that we have a mixed, a mixed group joining us. We are very pleased that uh, we, we <laughs> were able to, to, to present this, this, uh, this webinar to, to a very wide, a, a, a audience, which is uh, quite good for us. And I'll take, I think, just looking at the questions that are coming in, a lot of interesting questions. I see one here that says, are there changes coming to other regions, e.g. USA or Canada? I think I, I would like to, to, to take that question. I mean, thank you for the question uh, uh, up front. I mean, if we look at Canada, Canada has been revising, I mean, for the past, I don't know, 10 years, they have this discussion on reviewing the how drugs are dealt with in Canada. They have this system of drugs are considered as, as, as new chemicals in Canada, and there is a dual approach where the Canadian Food and Drug Administration looks at the safety and the efficacy, and Environment Canada looks at the environmental aspects. Now, this is this is it's a paper exercise. You 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 have a form from E Canada. You fill in this information based on the tonnage of the drug, and then the Canadian Environmental Aid Protection Agency itself will do the risk assessment. However, that is going to change soon. How soon is not clear. So for Canada, we can say there, is, there are changes coming. For the U.S., the guidance is from 1998. There are no discussions at the moment on, on changes. But recently, I mean, recently as 2006, there was a new uh, addition to that guidance to deal with endocrine uh, compounds. And I mean, regulation, the, the U.S. system is a bit different with, with how, uh, in, in complexity. With the EU going forward and making these changes, I think the U.S. at some point will follow suit. How soon? It is unclear at the moment. That's, that's one. And I see, I see another one regarding endocrine. Are there any specific changes with respect to endocrine testing for pharmaceuticals? I would say yes, it's the new guidance clarifies what studies have to be performed. If we look at the old guidance, oh, I think the question, I can't read the questions. Chrissy, please, could you read, read the questions for me? Absolutely, Dr. Fon, and, and let's continue with that question. Are there any specific yes. changes with respect to endocrine testing for pharmaceuticals? Thank you very much, Chrissy. The, the new guidance has just clarified what studies are required and how that assessment should be made. In the old guidance, there is nothing about endocrine substances. 
endocrine substances are only discussed in the Q&A document. That is not the change per se that the new guidance has just clarified and, and put everything under, under the same document for, for, for authorization holders and, and testing laboratories as us to, to, to use. Thank you very much, Chrissy. Next question. Yes, thank you, Dr. Fon. Now, does the new, does the all new MAA include middle or large molecules such as oligonucleotides or antibodies? Thank you very much for that question, Chrissy. It does. I mean, if we start with antibodies in general, an antibody drug conjugate will have, in most cases, a small molecule attached to to to. To, to a biologic, so that small molecule is what is, is, is covered in this new guidance. That's, that's how the new guidance approaches it. In certain aspects, you have to do a tailored assessment. And when it comes to large molecules, we have to follow that phase one uh, tree to make sure we, we capture whether A, this large molecule is naturally occurring, B, if it's naturally occurring, is there any change to the structure? and see is there, is, there, is there a previous assessment. If, if we establish that it's a naturally occurring molecule, which is a macromolecule, then the risk assessment itself will, will be a waiver, so to speak. Thank you. Next question, Christine. Yes. Now, the FDA released ERA Q&A for drugs with estrogenic androgenic activities in 2016. New EU guidelines cover requirement does the new EU guidelines cover requirement for FDA Q&A, and do we need to evaluate these separately? Thanks very much, Christy, for, for, for that question. The answer is, is yes and no. And I mean, you, you, need, you can use the same information to respond to that FDA, FDA 2006 Q&A that, that you use for, for, for the EU. The, the only way is how do you present the information? If we just look at the EU risk assessment system for, for human drugs, for most drugs, only a categorical exclusion will apply because they, they fall under the, the threshold for, for the full assessment. In that case, that's where that Q&A guidance comes in. You may need to, to address your, your, your estrogenic or androgenic mode of action. The EU requires a full assessment. Now, the same study that, that, that is done, our recommendation has always been for, 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 for sponsors who are in that position to, to consult with the FDA and the EU to make sure the studies that are being proposed and performed will allow them to address both the concerns from the EU and the concerns from, from, from the FDA. The way the data is presented is a bit different. That's the only difference, is the same data. So, and that difference is just because of how the assessment is, is, is performed in, in these two jurisdictions. Thank you very much, Chrissy. Thanks, Dr. Khan. More. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. We have time for a few more. Now, do we need to measure log KOW at different pHs if a compound is ionizable? Good question. Thanks, Chrissy. That's correct. You, the new guidance recommends, and the old guidance, so if, if I have to be, to, to, to be frank as well, recommends three pH values, five, seven, and nine. So the, the answer is yes. Very good. And here's another question. Now, with regard to endocrine active substances, if a teratogenic compound does not have any endocrine disrupting potential, can we assume it as non-EAS? That's a tricky one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, I mean, the, the way the guidance is structured at the moment is that we are looking at endocrine compounds that affect reproductive processes. That's where this, this assessment is going. For teratogenic compounds, it may lead to, I mean, if you are doing a PBT assessment, that toxicity, you could get a toxicity label based on, on that, not, not the, the endocrine mode of action. You will not be doing a, a fish full life cycle study to, to address a teratogenicity, so to speak. So that is not covered under the current guidance we are looking at at, at the moment. I think even for, for, for the 
Q&A from, from the FDA as well. They are not looking at, 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 at that sort of uh, drug substances, although it may present an extraordinary circumstance. You can address that by other ways, not necessarily by performing chronic fish studies. Thanks, PC. Sure thing. Now, um, I think we have time for maybe two more quick ones. When do you think okay. the final guidance will be issued? Yes. Uh, I don't know. I mean, if we, if we just, when the guidance was released in, in November, if we followed previous approaches, we're looking at the new guidance probably end of 2018. But we, there was a recent IPI, the, uh, the Intelligent Assessment of Pharmaceutical and the Environment. They had a, a conference thing in, in June. And, and one of the speakers in that conference actually participating in, it's one of the participants in writing this guidance. And because of external issues, I mean, most of them, the Brexit where the agency has moved to Amsterdam to a temporary site, and then they have to move to a permanent site. The agency is concentrating on its core mission at the moment, which is to make sure drugs are available, to look at safety, pharmacovigilance as, as, as such. So that adds time on this. The best guess, and, and, and this is just a guess, is it's not looking like this guidance will be finalized by the end of this year. So it, it's an open question, really. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fawn. And we'll end with this final question. Are these, risk, are these risk assessments performed just as a checkup on the environment? Or if they determine that a drug is harming the environment, will they change it? I'm just confused about what is done with these risk assessments. That is a very tricky one as well. If we look at, I mean, just from the, the US side, the FDA may refuse to file if you don't have a risk assessment. That's, that's the grounds for, for refusing to file for the, for the FDA. So it's not just an exercise. I mean, it, the, it, it has a part to play. Some, I mean, it's, we have to be clear as well what this actually means. A risk assessment will not prevent a drug coming to the market. That's, I mean, that's, that's not where we are going with this. A risk assessment will provide the agency with information on how to regulate this drug. This may be maybe telling the sponsor to, to perform, I don't know, uh, after uh, author of the drug to, to perform studies, to do routine checks, uh, to, to, to go out and take samples and, and that sort of thing to make sure there are no effects in the environment. From the European side as well, the agency is clamping down on, I mean, a risk assessment is part of the marketing authorization application. So in certain cases, if you don't submit a risk assessment, you may, depending on how you, the utility of the drug, you may be given a temporary authorization until you submit a full risk assessment, then you get your permanent, permanent authorization. Now, for, for a pharmaceutical company, that just adds a layer of complexity because every time this dossier is open, the rapporteurs have to meet and there is some financial uh, cost to, 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 to having this done in, in many steps. The short answer is, a risk assessment is part of the authorization process and must be submitted by the terms of, of, of the current EU and, and FDA uh, guidance. And the second part of the question is, with, is the information, how is the information used? In certain cases, some drugs based on the risk assessment will go into a monitoring program. That's, that's if, I mean, for a pharmaceutical company, that could, that could uh, mean a big financial burden because the regulator required to go out, take samples, assess these samples, and then uh, provide the result. In some cases, we, in Sweden, we, we, we have what is called environmentally good drug, if I could use, use that, I could translate it directly. In that case, they have a system where if you have two drugs, everything okay, everything the same, same therapeutic function, but one of them has a good environmental profile, the Swedish agency will recommend that drug in public procurement. So, so it, there are other ways this information is useful and the risk assessment is part of the authorization process uh, 
by regulation. Thank you very much, Chrissy. Thank you, Dr. Fun, and thank you for your time today and your excellent presentation and insight. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor Smithers for underwriting today's educational webcast. Now this webcast can be viewed on demand and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you again soon. Bye for now. Thank you everybody, bye.